All right, welcome back to our um, Passion Project Genius Hour Prairie Lakes AEA webinar series. Today, we're really excited to have Cassie Dillon with us. She's a first grade teacher at Gilmore City Bradgate. And I'm going to not take much of her time and go ahead and let her kick off how she's doing um, some uh, passion projects, both in her classroom and at their school. Yeah, awesome. Hi. Welcome, thanks Cassie. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. Like Leslie said, um, I am a first grade teacher and I'm a first grade teacher here at Gilmore City Bradgate and I have been teaching first grade for about seven years, I think. Yeah, seven years. And okay, now is it full screen? Yes. Perfect. So I've been teaching first grade for seven years and of those seven years, I've been doing passion projects for five. Um, it started, my, my superintendent came to me and he was telling me about Genius Hour and Passion Projects and I really liked the idea of students taking ownership of their own learning through their passions. So um, we, we actually, we hopped on a plane and we went to Calabasas, California and we visited a school there called The Muse. Um, they are doing fantastic things out there. It's all passion project based. Um, they have their own garden. That's where we got our inspiration for our school garden. And the students um, just have a lot of individual learning experiences. So if you haven't heard of the Muse, if you're not following them, I highly suggest you look them up. They have a Facebook page and they have a Twitter page. Um, on this page right here, you can see my email address and my Twitter handle. So um, once I got interested in passion projects, um, I just kind of dove right in and like I said, I've been doing them for about five years now and I've learned things over the years and this is this what I'm going to share with you today is kind of where I'm at today. Um, this is how I, I lead passion projects in my classroom and this is what we do in our school. So every year at the very beginning of the year, first grade starts out with a whole class passion project and that turns out to be our mascot. So we started out this year by making a list of animals that we like. And then we talked about characteristics of those animals and how we might have things that are in common with those animals. So um, somebody chose a sloth and a sloth is really slow. Do you think that represents first graders? Or do you think something like a cheetah might represent first graders more? So we narrowed our mascot down to a shark and we decided that we were gonna be the first grade sharks because first graders lose a lot of teeth and sharks lose a lot of teeth. and Sharks are cool and we're cool and they like to eat meat and we like to eat meat. So we decided on sharks and then from there we started our learning. So we had a concept web and every day we sit down around that concept web and we talk about all the things that we know about sharks and then we apply standards to it. So within our passion project, every group has to fulfill a reading, a writing, a math standard, and then they have to choose between social studies and science. So we talk about how we can apply those standards within our passions, and then we work towards them. I also teach them how to present information to the community when we have our culmination night. Some ways that we present information within first grade is we have um, iMovies, we can make books, we can make posters, and then they can just do a simple writing sample. And then I also take quite a bit of time to teach them how to do research. So this is an example of our whole class passion project that we did at the beginning of the year. These are just some of the artifacts, some of the artifacts that I kept. Um, we finished up with these in the beginning of October. So you can see over on the left-hand side, we have our concept web. And the different colors depict the different days. So the blue, the dark blue is what we put down the very first day. And then we went back with different colors just so we could see how our learning grew with every day. So as you can see over on the left-hand side of the concept web, there's a bubble called Wonder. That is something that I think is really important for all of the students to have on their concept webs because that's going to turn into their driving question. So with our sharks group, we met a literacy standard by talking about facts versus opinion. Students had to pair up, they had to read the sentences about sharks and then they had to squirt them. 
I don't have a picture of our math example, but the way we um, achieved our math standard is we looked up all of the different types of sharks. And as you can see, that's over in our concept web. We wrote down all the different types of sharks on a poster. And then the students had to go and do research to figure out how long each shark was. They had to write down the measurement on that poster. And then we went out in the hallway and with masking tape, we measured out how long that shark would actually be. And then we stood back and we looked at all of the different sharks and we asked what's the longest, what's the shortest, which two sharks are very similar in length. Um, so that's how we fulfilled our math standard. And then our science standard for sharks was learning about the life cycle of sharks. And then we also went back and we learned about what they needed in order to um, survive. So that was our whole group passion project. And as you can see, there's our wonder, a little um, close up there. And this is how I drive. Um, this is how we get the driving question, and then this is how I kind of drive the instruction and how I implement the lessons to fulfill those standards. So, for instance, when it says, what is the biggest shark, I knew from there that I could instantly get a measurement and data standard in just from that wonder. Um, some tips and tricks that I have found throughout the years. Um, always spend time teaching how to research. I know it seems like a very tedious task, but I'm telling you, if you take the time to teach them the little things in the very beginning, it's going to save you a lot of time in the end. Um, I'm talking about how to get to the Google app, how to use voice to text, because in first grade, they have a hard time spelling. So I teach them how to click that little microphone down in the corner and how to enunciate your words so the iPad can understand you. Um, I teach them how to, if they want to narrow their searches down just to images or just to videos, how they can do that. Um, at the beginning of every single passion, I always take time to sit down with the whole entire class and I talk to each and every group before I let them go. We talk about what standard they're working on, how they're meeting that standard, what was the last thing they did? What are they going to do today? And I make sure that they all know what they're supposed to do before I let them start. And then after our passion projects time, I always make sure that I sit down and I jot a few notes as to what that group did that day, how far they got, what their next step is, et cetera. So this is what my notebook looks like um, when we did our first cycle with passion projects this year. So we did our whole group, which was shark. Then we did our cycle one, which was animals. And what I do at the very beginning is I have my students spread out all around the room and I give them a piece of paper and I tell them to write down their three favorite animals or three animals that they want to learn more about. That way, I know that Bobby isn't just going to put down what Susie did because he wants to be in her group. So the students don't see what other people are putting down. Um, and then I take their papers and then I group them according to what their interests were. So as you can see over on the left-hand side with the tree frogs, I just, it's, a, it's just a regular old notebook. I put down what their passion is at the very top. I put down the kids' initials that are in that group. And then I write down what standards they're working towards. So for my tree frogs group, they were working in science first. They did a life, um, life science standard of the basic needs of what tree frogs need in order to stay alive. And the reason why I do the cycles with the animals, and then you'll see the second one is hobbies, is because I can kind of cluster those standards. So every single group can do that science standard because they're all learning about animals and all animals need, need needs. They all need something. So I can cluster those together and I know that they're all going to be working on that same standard when it comes to science. Now, when it gets to literacy and math, it looks a little bit different. So the tree frog group, what they did is they created a Venn diagram and they compared a fiction versus nonfiction book. And as you can see, they covered four standards with that, with reading informational books and reading foundation skills. Um, and then if you go over to, you can take a look at those other ones, but if you go over to dogs over on the right-hand side, you can see that for science, they did the basic needs, but then what they did is they took what they found from science and then they implemented it into math. So what they found out what they needed, and then they put it on a separate poster math um, for math. They put down the needs, and then they did research to see how much each one of those needs would cost. So they had to figure out how much a dog ate per day. Then they had to figure out how much that cost per week and then per month. 
And then they had to add all of those up. They had to look up uh, the price of a dog house because the dog needs shelter. And then they had to look up how much water a dog eats. And then they called city hall to see how much that those many gallons cost per month. So it was actually a really great, um, just kind of scaffolding how they started with science and then they took what they knew from science and they applied it to their math standard as well. Um, and then down at below at the bottom, I wanted to show you um, this little nugget of mine. He is in this group, but he also has an IEP. So that's just how I differentiated with him. Instead of um, filling those standards that his partner did up top, he did something a little bit on his own. Um, what we did is we went out and we found clip art pictures of dogs and then we had him color those dogs according to what the page said. So I just put, I see black dogs, I see brown dogs, I see yellow dogs. So he had to read that and then he had to color that in according to what the picture said. And then the math, the quantity to identification is um, he just had to count how many dogs were in a row and then write that numeral down. So those, um, those activities that he did there met his goals on his IP. So that's how you can kind of differentiate between students. Um, after we get done with this cycle, we have a culminating night and sometimes students don't get done. Sometimes they don't have all of their standards met, but that's just a natural consequence that they have when their parents show up and they see that a lot of other groups have five to you know, 10 articles and they only have one artifact to show. So we have parents come in and we share our passion. So over on the left-hand side, you can see a student sharing a turtle with her mother. Um, down below, uh, we can see a student that created a habitat for his animal. Up top is an older student. His passion was gardening. So he actually, he planted and harvested, I think about 20 pounds of potatoes. And then he cooked and served them at our harvest supper. Um, we have a student down below with the leopard dress. Her passion was tigers. She had a few vocabulary words down there on the desk, so we make sure that we pinpoint vocabulary if we're learning anything new. Um, she talked about how tigers were endangered and the reason why they were endangered. That's what the paper is next to her. She had an iMovie talking about the needs of tigers in order to stay alive. And then back behind her is a poster. What she did is she found out how many tigers were in the wild and how many tigers were in captivity, and then she added those two numbers together. And as you can see, the number in the wild is 3,200. So um, you, can, you can definitely say that she is working out of first grade standards right there because we only have to know on numbers up to 120. So that's the great thing about passions is they can work above and beyond what their grade standards call for. So Cassie, before you move forward, um, quick question. Um, as you think about um, the, the kids working through their passions and um, sort of you back mapping maybe the standards, in, you know, in um, their projects. What have you noticed um, from the kids' standpoint in terms of what's different for them in terms of their learning, um, their level of engagement compared to maybe what typically happens sort of in math or literacy or science? And also what's different for you as a teacher? Could so you just briefly share? Yeah, so um, what I guess what came to my mind when you asked me that question is I had a student that started about halfway through the school year, um, two years ago, I'd say. And when she first came to me, we, um, we were working on a project. And I remember starting a brand new project the day that she came. And I said, okay, what questions do you have for me? And my students didn't have any questions. And I said, okay, you're dismissed. And they got up and they went. And they did it because they were independent learners at that time and they knew what they needed to do in order to reach their goal. But my new kiddo, she sat there and she just looked at me and I said, honey, what's wrong? And she said, what do you want me to do? She was waiting for someone to tell her each and every step that she had to take in order to go start that project. Um, so I can, I can definitely see a huge change in our students just with them being um, more independent in their learning, knowing what they need to do to get things done and doing it and not waiting for a teacher to kind of spoon feed them what they need. Is that kind of the, the answer that you were looking for, Julie? Yeah, just what, yeah, I mean, what's different? And then what about for you as a teacher? What's different for you when, when these kids do this versus sort of what you do in more of a 
not tra to do traditional sense, I don't mean that in that way, but when they're not doing passion projects, what's different? What do you see from your standpoint as a teacher? So passion projects were um, a little difficult for some teachers to start just because the teacher lets go of control. So um, when we do passions, like I said, we, we all meet together and we talk about what they're going to work on, but then I let them go and it's up to them. I, I'm not going to hover over top of them and tell them that they need to get busy, that they need to, you know, do this and that. It's, it's their responsibility. And if they don't do the steps that they need to do, then they have to suffer the consequences when their parents show up and they don't have very much to show them. And I, I have seen that happen before. You know you're going to have students like that. Um, it's, it's their passion and they need to be in charge of it. So it's a little bit different in a sense of, you know, math where we, we talk about the steps they need to take in order to, you know, accomplish their goal. But with passions, it's all self-driven. So it looks a lot different. Um, sometimes it can be very chaotic. I, <laughs> I remember one day I had students that were hammering. Um, they were making a trap because their passion was hunting and trapping. So I had students with wood and nails and hammers in the classroom, and that's not something that you normally see in a first grade setting. I have students that need the help of our custodian every once in a while, and he'll come and grab them and take them out to our bus barn and drill holes in a pipe for them if that's what they need. Um, so it, it's very, very different from a traditional classroom setting, I would say, in that aspect. So before you proceed, I'm wondering if Pamela, George, Leslie, do, do you guys have any questions so far in, in what you've heard? Not yet. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Cassie. Yeah, no problem. So uh, moving on, our cycle two subject is hobbies. We just started this one. So this is an example of one of my group's concept web. Um, their, their hobby is sewing. They don't know how to do it yet, but they want to learn. Um, and as you can see, there's just two bubbles coming off of the main one. Uh, one says things, and it says something you can sew is a pillowcase and something you can sew is clothes. And then their wonders are how does the sewing machine work and how do you use the sewing machine? So as you can see, it's not quite as in depth as what our sharks one was but they're going to continue to add to it every day. So this is just kind of our starting point with these two kiddos. Um, some things that are different um, in cycle two than it is with our cycle one and our whole class passion project is obviously our expectations are higher because they've already had a little bit of experience. And then we also have some group norms. So as you can see over on the right hand side, we have this form that they have to fill out when they start. Um, up at the top, they list all of the group members' names, and then they assign roles. So there's a team facilitator, a taskmaster, a recorder, and then a team representative. Um, the team representative is the person that comes and talks to the teacher if need be, or they go and they talk to other groups to communicate with them. They make sure that all of the voices are heard. So I really appreciate having a team representative, especially when I have classes that are really large because instead of having 23 students come to me, I only have one team representative from every group. So instead of having 23 come to me, I have a max of five that are allowed to come to me because that's their representative and that's the person that talks for them. Um, that really helps out. And then down at the bottom, we have a space for them to make up team norms or rules, if you want to call them that. Um, and then down at the bottom, they have accountability steps. So the first step, if a team member is breaking the team norms, is they have an unofficial verbal warning. And then the second one is they have an official verbal warning. And then if it continues, they will have a consequence. And the final consequence is that they could possibly get fired from their group, and they would have to fill all of their standards on their own. So this really holds the students accountable. We do this with the older grades as well, um, and it really works with them, but we do start it in first grade. Um, in our other grades here at GCB, we have a, um, a progressional independence plan. So what we do in preschool and kindergarten is they are whole group all year long, and they do that by having a star student of the week. So one student will be chosen, and then they share what their passion is, and then the teacher um, she creates lessons in math or maybe in reading or science, if it's applicable, 
about their passion. So for instance, if a student is passionate about farming, the teacher will go find books about farming. They might do some math activities about farm animals, um, so on and so forth. In first grade, like I said, we start out as a whole group just to model, and then we move on to small group. In second grade, it's all small group. Third and fourth grade, they start as a small group, and then they end in partners by the end of the year. And then fifth and sixth grade, there are always some students that, that need a little bit of help. So some of those will have partners, but otherwise they're independent for the whole year. Um, and then last but not least, my hopes and dreams for passion projects. Like I said, this is my fifth year. Um, I'm hoping that someday we will find a way to have every student um, impact their community through their passion. Um, I, I see it already, but I'm hoping that in the future, every single student will be engaged and they will be fulfilling standards. Like I said, it's, it's happening, but it's not every single student. Um, some have a hard time with that independence. And I'm hoping that someday every single student will gain independence, critical thinking, I'm sorry, creative thinking skills, problem solving skills, and they learn how to collaborate with their peers. So those are my hopes and dreams. I'm seeing a lot of it happening, but some students are still struggling, but we're hoping to get there someday. So what questions do you guys have for me? Um, you sort of shared some hints and tips along the way, so I don't want to ask something repetitive, but as we have people thinking about, this is where I want to get started, um, or I'm just digging into this or dipping a toe in, like, do you have any, I learned this lesson and now I can pass it on to you advice so you don't make the same mistake kind of things, like, that jump up into your mind? Yeah, so um, I would definitely say that it, it is a lot to start off, um, but you have to take that step and try because it is so beneficial for your students. I would definitely say to start off with a whole class passion just to model how to do those little things. Um, just, just the little things that you wouldn't think of, especially with those younger grades, you know, with, with an iPad, how to save a picture, how to go back and retrieve it, how to put it into an iMovie. Those are things that you can do in mini lessons. You don't have to teach those to each individual student separately. Teach it as a little mini lesson to the whole group. And then when you see that they're naturally gaining some independence and they're learning how to do some of those things, that's when you can set them free and put them into small groups or possibly some partners. Cassie, I was wondering, you know, when you laid out what it looks like for all the grades, so how many projects typically happen throughout the year for each grade? Usually about three. Okay. Yep. So, um, well, I should say for my grade, it's three, but that, that's not including the, the whole class passion project. So typically, probably, I would probably say four for the older kids, one per quarter. And you said that you guys were focusing on the creativity mm -hmm. um, C of the four Cs primarily, is that correct? Yes, so um, that's something that our superintendent is really driving right now. He wants to see if the creativity within our students is growing. So yes, we do have rubrics and we, um, we fill those out after every quarter to see the growth in our students' creativity. What do you notice about the parent night with the kids sharing from the kids' standpoint and from the parents' standpoint? Oh my gosh, the kids are so excited to share their passions to their parents. Um, you know, kids, they love getting their parents into the building and showing them their world. But they're so excited to show their parents, um, grandparents, even community members that don't have any children or grandchildren in the community, they come and they check it out. Um, it's a great experience. I see parents that are sometimes very um, impressed with what their child can do. And then I see other parents that are a little disappointed, you know, that their child didn't get as much done as others. But I just, I strongly encourage my parents to voice that to their student. And then we sit down um, and we have a conversation about, you know, what did you get accomplished? What do you think um, you could do better next time? What's our goal for next time? And then kind of map that out to see where they need to be and what they need to get done to, to, get, to, to meet their goal. 
So I see um, a lot of honesty when it comes from parents, which I, I think is great. They don't, they don't tell their child that they did a really great job, you know, if they don't have anything finished. What about parent I, involvement? I assume there's some sort of spectrum, but do you have any expectations or any commitments that go home? Is it sort of dependent on project? What does that look like? So we actually um, don't have any expectations for parents, but um, in first grade, I always, when it comes to open house, I always have a series of questions that I ask parents. Um, and one thing that I ask them in at open house is, what do you think your child is passionate about? Um, what do they spend most of their time doing? And would you be willing to help your child with their passion project at home? So I know at the very beginning of the year, which parents are open to letting their child go home, you know, take their passion project home and working on it and which ones aren't. Um, and then I have some parents that just like doing those fun things with their students. I had a student one year, his his passion was volcanoes. So on a snow day, his mom and him, they created their own volcano at home. But no, there, there's no set expectations for parent involvement. Um, we hope it's something that parents do on their own. And sometimes they do, but sometimes they don't. Cassie, I appreciated the self-assessment. And I know that was at the end of the day um, that you have your kids kind of rate themselves and then and I know that that's the whole day, um, not just the passion project um, time, but I, could you just briefly talk about what that looks like? Yeah, so at the, and very, why you do that? Yeah, at the very beginning of the year, um, I sat down with my students and we talked about kind of our group norms that we need to have throughout the day just so we can all be um, effective learners. What are the things that you need to feel safe? What are the things that you need in order to learn? Um, we made a list of all the things that the students need. And then what I did is I, I put it into a class pledge that hangs at the front of our room. So every morning our students, um, they stand and they salute because that's what they decided they wanted to do. They didn't wanna put their hand over their heart because that's a different pledge. But they salute our class pledge and then they recite the class pledge every single day that states all of those things that they need. And then what I did is I created um, just a table that has all of those norms and then there's a smiley face, a middle face, and then a sad face. And then they have to evaluate themselves on how they did at meeting those norms and all of those things that are in our class pledge at the very beginning of the day. Um, and then I take a different color, like a, a colored pencil or a marker of some sort. And if I don't agree with where they placed themselves, I'll put a check mark somewhere else and we'll talk about why I disagree with what they chose. And then I just initial it at the bottom and they take it home to show their parents. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. Any other questions? I don't know that I have any offhand. I was fortunate to observe, so that helps. It helped me right. just be in the classroom so a lot of my questions were Cassie would you put up your contact and info and you're open to people are interested that yeah so that I've actually true? sorry you're cutting out I've actually had a lot of students or a lot of teachers come to my classroom to um, see how we do things here and and anybody is more than welcome to come and, and check it out. So my here's my contact information right here again. Thank you. For sure, absolutely. All right, so that's awesome. Cassie, we really appreciate you opening up your classroom and extending that invitation. If people wanna come check out what you're doing, um, seeing firsthand is always a great option if it is if it is an option. Wow, way to be repetitive, Leslie. Um, but seriously, thank you for taking time out of your afternoon. Um, we appreciate you sharing your experiences and expertise. And um, I will get this uploaded, so thank you. Yeah, no Thanks, Cassie. Yeah, see you guys.